Welcome to the Leaders Agenda, a podcast series dedicated to reimagining leadership within life sciences. Today's guest is Ken Perhap, a lifetime innovator within life sciences who has just recently retired from his position as the Chief Scientific Officer of Integral Life Sciences. I had the opportunity to put out the foundational innovation question to Ken, asking about how he has built innovation agendas in companies large and small, and how we can learn about that and understand how company can actually not just have one breakthrough innovation out there, but actually have a sustainable pipeline of innovation and the right rhythm, because that is what makes a difference for the patients and for the healthcare system. Here's Ken. And it's been kind of a diverse background for me. I went from small company and big company and back to small company or midsize. And it's funny, it's a topic that comes up no matter where I've been. Yes, and I want to explore the differences. Okay, we're going to start with the big thing, right? Um, because this is leader's agenda, right? Um, and I often wonder, like, how do you actually build a leader's agenda for innovation? What are sort of the one or two or three most important things that you have to have to do right so that you know it's the right agenda. So we're going to start with that conversation. Before we do though, can I ask you to explain what does a chief scientific officer actually do and is that the same as chief innovation officer? There's a lot of titles that are kind of being thrown around all over and everybody uses a different one at a different company. In my particular role or the ones that I've had as CSO, Chief Scientific, it was talking about strategy. It was really building where is the company going to go. So that integrated not just the front end, but also the back end of the process. You had to have processes involved as well. So it was involved in working on outside acquisitions. Um, a lot of this is not, not invented here. So also looking at new opportunities for the company to bring it in, trying to build a team inside, but then how do you take a product and how do you take a portfolio and develop that portfolio? So I guess in its broadest term, it was really determining the, the scientific portfolio and uh, the direction for the company. No pressure at all, huh? No, no, but it's a team event. So that's just it too. It's like, everybody's, oh, you're the CSO, you have to. Uh, nobody, nobody does this alone. I mean, I'm, I'm a movie buff, as I think you know, and um, there's Clint Eastwood movie, um, Magnum Force, 1973. He <laughs> says, a man's got to know his limitations. Um, and I've always believed in that. I always use it in my presentations, because I think um, when you walk in the room, you, shouldn't, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. And I think that's something else that falls into companies falling into this not invented here, and one person has to do it. So yeah, so that's kind of the role of the CSO, but it's not just his job. Yeah, it's being able to harness the harness the, the great minds that come together and also execute, it sounds yep. like. Yep. Okay, so can we go all the way to the beginning then? Yep. So if, in fact, part of that job is to figure out what is the right agenda um, and what's going to be the agenda that makes a difference, not just for the company, but for the patients out there eventually, right? That's the most important part. Well, how do you answer that question? I mean, there's so many different things to choose from, we, especially these days. I mean, if you think about it, the way I look at it is, I think science is a way ahead of us. I think technology is a way ahead of us, meaning there's so much opportunity to do so many different things. Yeah. But patients are still looking for more and more uh, in a, innovative ways mm -hmm. of dealing with the, the whole patient journey. So how do, you, how do you start? Where do you start? How do you choose? And I think part of it is what you just touched on is the patients. Um, I think we, we lose track many times of the patient and you know, we say that we have marketing, but is it downstream or is it upstream marketing? And what does marketing do? I mean, when I started, and that was, I don't even want to say how many years ago now, the idea was you went out and you talked to a surgeon and Bob said, I should do this product and that's what you need. Or I talked to Bill and that was where all of the products came from. And I don't think that's really getting down to the patient data, that unmet need, that basic unmet need. I think you really do have to go back. You have to do broader surveys. And we used to insist part of our, at the end of the year, you had objectives for each employee. If somebody had to go out and you had to at least once during the year go out and interact with the patient. So actually we were, meet a real patient. Meet a real patient. When we were doing trauma, <laughs> they would ride along in the ambulance wow. um, to be able to see what it was. And that was part of their job requirements because you can't just sit in this isolated little room and say, oh, I know what the patient needs. You actually have to go out there to see it. 
You know, I love that because, you know, I'm also a patient myself. I, I call my, my uh, brain aneurysm world my underground research, right, as a bit <laughs> into the patient world. And this is an important point, right, because there isn't a single company these days that doesn't talk about patient centricity. Right. Do you think anybody does that really well? I have to be honest and say I don't think so. Um, I, think, I think maybe now what we're seeing, COVID, um, has really kind of changed the map a little bit. So I think some of the companies now are getting more towards getting out there because they have to virtually. Mm. But that's the flip side to that is how do you do that virtually? So when we talk about right. patient interaction, it's really hard, yeah. you know, but, but I don't know, I, I just don't see it. Maybe some of the tech companies, that's why I say with COVID, I think some of the tech companies kind of started to figure out what do, what do people need? So their customer is, I need to be able to work at home. I need to be able to have good video. I need to have good, and they've really kind of moved that innovation bar way up to be able to do it all the way up to virtual marketing and the rest of it. So I think the tech companies, but in the healthcare space, I'm not sure a lot of companies do it. They're starting to do it. Um, I think GE has got a good handle on it. People are starting to talk about artificial intelligence and um, more robotics. And so I think there are some companies out there that, you know, I can mention several of them that I think are probably better than others, but I don't think anybody's kind of answered that, that the one. I mean, if there were that, you can look to that one company. Yeah, and how, how do you really do it? Yeah. So uh, help me, uh, just can you just remind me in your last position with Integra, right. what kind of therapeutic areas did you cover? We covered neuro, so it was a big, I mean, a big portion of the company is a neuro division. So that be whether it be monitoring brain pressures or trying to have interventions or instruments. And the other side was regenerative medicine. Okay. So talking about healing the body in a whole brand new way of letting the body heal itself. But you need to be able to intervene in that. So the regenerative piece, and people say, oh, regenerative medicine, it's new, it's brand new. Mm. Um, the Integra product, as an example, was invented by Dr. Yanas and Dr. Burke. Um, up in Boston, and it was in the 70s and the 80s. Um, he, they were actually named for, they got into the Smithsonian for being able to come up with the technology. But I think it's an interesting story as well, if you don't mind. It's like, so here you had Dr. Yanas, so he worked at MIT. Um, great guy working on materials, collagen, all of these things, but he couldn't figure out how to make a product that was, he said, where am I gonna go, what am I gonna need? Here Dr. Burke, who was one of the top burn surgeons, had patients dying in front of him. Mm -hmm. And they were on the table and they were dying and he said, I need to cover it. So he was trying to make materials to treat the patients, but he had no idea what he was doing. So the two of them started talking to each other, wouldn't you know? Kind of a cool philosophy. There, there like, comes the, there there comes the, the innovation, and, right? Uh -huh. and there comes the innovation yeah. and they work together and they developed a product that's now revolutionized how people are treated with burns. So I, I love that story. And when you talk to Dr. Yanas, who's still around, I just talked to him last week again, he's still out there trying to innovate, thinking of new ways, things that patients need. He said, I know there's still a problem out there, but he said, I got to find somebody to help me. So I, I think this, this talking, it seems so basic, but just being able to get out to a patient, talking to people yeah. and versus sitting in a room isolated saying, I have to come up with an idea and I got to write it down and then I'm going to patent it. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like that, you know, if I build it, somebody will somehow be able to use it. Come. Yeah, I, I, not going to happen. So, but the, the patient part of this conversation is also difficult if you start looking at more some of the more chronic types of yeah. illnesses, right? Because it's not just about um, one part of that illness, right. it's the whole journey. Yeah. Um, and, and getting to understand the journey inside the patient's environment. And I think this is one, one thing that became very important for me to also yeah. as a patient, because a lot of people who go through a brain aneurysm don't come out whole, yeah. so to speak. Right. I mean, we have, we have issues afterwards, um, mm -hmm. some of which are very serious, and they change our quality of life in a very different way. So the patient journey part becomes an important, important conversation if we really want to get healthcare, I think, to a different level. Yeah. What, what ways do you, like what are the ways that companies can deploy to get closer to the patient? And, and, and what are the constraints? You know, I'll start with the constraints and then I'll go back to the point. All of these, I think um, one of the things that's happened and we all know it is in today's world, it's around money and dollars. Mm. Um, and whether it be for the hospital system, can the hospital system afford to do it? The doctor, how am I gonna get paid? 
as they start now all of a sudden having to work for hospitals and the rest of it. Are they making the right decisions? Um, so there's some products, and I won't go into specifics, but the doctors take the product, and if they apply it once mm -hmm. and it works, great for the patient, great mm -hmm. for the system, but they get paid once. If there's another product out there and they have to apply it maybe five, six times and they get paid each time that they're going to do it and they have to be able to make, here's this dilemma. And I'm not saying anything wrong at all about physicians because I don't think most people are into it just for the money. But those are tough decisions in the hospital. There may be 60 things that are out there that all work really well, but they have to look at the economics and say, well, I'm gonna only keep one or two on the shelf and I'm gonna be able to be able to supply just those couple of products. So I think even the hospital starts doing, so all of a sudden economics and dollars and return, and then now you go to the company, there could be a really cool product, but there's a lot of risk and it's five, 10 years out to be able to get to that portfolio, to be able to deliver it. Meanwhile, you have new regulations, EU MDR, all these pressures that are coming on it to be able to limit how much money you spend. So I, I think you just, yeah, you're, you're caught in this conundrum of, yeah, I should worry about the future and I should solve this problem, but if I don't take care of today's actions and what I need to do to keep alive, especially now with COVID and all the hospital things that are coming out and how it's affecting companies, I'm not gonna get there. So where do you focus your attention? And usually everybody says, well, if, if I don't worry about tomorrow, you know, that's fine, because I just need to get through today. So, but tomorrow never comes. Yes. You know, it's, so I, I, think, I think what the, you know, it's really hard and how do you carve out that space and that time and that money for that front end and for the innovation piece of this. And how do you really do that? So that gets back to the patient again, your question about the whole thing. You gotta get out there and say, well, okay, can I tackle? Can I really afford both in terms of, do I have enough knowledge and do I have enough money to tackle the whole continuum or do I have one piece of it? And if I only have one piece of this continuum, how do I interact with these other pieces? Well, that's a competitive company. Can I interact with them? Well. Why not? I mean, you know, it used to be no. Right. It used it's, to be no for, yeah, and, and to some degree, sometimes still is a no, right? Yeah. yeah but but, but you're talking about really is can I interact with sure. a couple of different ways of interacting, right? One is that we actually build a strategic alliance or partnership, yep. and, uh, and we are focusing on the continuum jointly, yep. but we have our own roles within yep. that, right? Yep. The other one is probably a, a bit more segregated, uh, mm -hmm. just understanding it in context of the whole, but not really, not really collaborating. Yeah, and I think this not invented here syndrome is, 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 can be a real issue of, you know, it used to be when I started again many, many years ago, everything was done at, within the company. Yeah. So you had an R&D team, they came up with the innovation, they did the product development, they did everything. And I think in today's world, um, coin, a term a lot of people are coining now is this innovation ecosystem. Mm. Um, and you, know, you see it in the tech world, but I see it in the healthcare space of being able to find people and resources outside that can actually work together to help solve that and who see the whole problem. And they're not just looking at it from your company perspective. Well, who starts that? I say it's the R&D, coming back to the scientific thing. I'll use an example of, you know, in an, another company, and I'll reference it at the, it was, I was with Baxter Healthcare for many years. And when we were there, um, we were working on an innovative product. It was a blood substitute product. Mm -hmm. And so it was cool, first of its kind. So we had the innovation piece of it, but now how do you get it solved? So we had dollars. So the good part was Baxter being a larger company, you had deeper pockets than a startup, which is always an issue, mm -hmm. startup versus yeah. our, but we had the dollars, but we didn't have that many people and it was still a concept. So um, this was back in the late 80s before it kind of became Vogue. I'll call it virtual networks. So mm. my job was I worked with 53 universities around the world. 53? 53. 53. That was my job. And that was how I ended up getting traveling so much was because I would even just trying to see each one once a year was once a week. And they were around the world. Global is another piece of this. It wasn't just US centric or whatever. And so we'd actively pursue it. So we said, send in your ideas. Do you have an idea? So you have to have a proactive approach to trying to bring in. You ideas. invite, you're inviting invite those in. ideas. But so we, how did you choose those? So you, you, you must have done some research and you knew exactly which academic partners you would want to have. Yeah, it was critical. So um, I would go online and I'd say, okay, for example, in the cardiovascular space, you go and you look and say, who published and where was there? And you see Eric Topol published 495 papers. Hmm, 
Mm. Probably a pretty good guy. And then you look at the space, in. might want to talk to him and get him involved. So we went out and we would make a list of the top 10 people in the world that were in each one of them. And we were looking at five or six different indications. And we'd say, we need to get at least a couple of these guys on board. And now, did you bring them together or, or uh, is, there, is there like a consortium that comes out of that or, or is it more that you interact and bring them into the right places? Did the, you know, how does that process work? A little bit of both. So again, we did the proactive of going out looking for them, but also we'd get ideas in as yeah. soon as you started doing it. So it would go out there and had set up, so I said there were six indications. So I set up working groups. And we said, all right, here's one or two KOLs and then some younger people that were there. And intentionally look for people that were MD, PhDs, if we could. And we said, okay. So we'd go out, we'd interact with them, and we had meetings once a quarter with groups. And these would be smaller groups of five to six people each one. And they would interact with each other. So now all of a sudden we had collaboration across universities and with us, because we'd always set up these meetings in between come up with those ideas that were there, and then you would go and you'd say, all right, this next group would do it, and then once a year, we'd bring all of these people together for a meeting. So now you had 50 people in six indications that are collaborating in cross-fertilization. That's interesting. So is it fair to say that at the sort of heart of that conversation was a problem to be solved, yeah. was a patient an problem to be solved, yes. or on mid need, as you say it, and as we call it in the yeah. industry, right? So, so did that on mid need evolve through that process? Meaning, you know, you often have a hypothesis of some sort, and you keep validating that, right? right? right. And so, on the patient side, I'm sure there's there's validation that yeah. needs to happen, especially if you're looking globally, yeah. um, and then through that process, how, how did the patient interact with the process of idea generation? And I'll be honest, and I'll say at the beginning, it wasn't, and we always used it kind of secondhand through the doctors by getting enough people on the outside. And then like I talked about, we would send people out to actually be in an ambulance because we were dealing with trauma as one indication. So you'd ride in an ambulance. Patient wasn't talking a whole lot. No, <laughs> they tend to be quiet. <laughs> they tend to be quiet along the way. As a matter of fact, that was actually a problem because we were trying to treat patients while they were completely unable to do it. So we had to change all of the regulations to be able to have waves of informed consent. So you'd have to go and give them the product before they said yes to the product because we had to believe that it was going to work. Oh my gosh, was, that's like a whole other story for us. Yeah, story yeah. Say. But so you'd interact with the patients, but with the doctors, but then, you know, you would slowly get it, and you'd tra this was all early preclinical, so it was right. all early innovative ideas. But the cool thing was, at least in my mind, is those docs, and because they're MD, PhDs, they learned how to use the product, and they learned what were the pros and the cons of it, taking it back to the patient again. Which patients would it work in? What's the best place for it to use? So they would do it, and then when we wanted to do a clinical trial, we already had our clinical team on board because they were all the ones who had tried it. Expert people who knew how to use the product, who wanted to do it, so they'd say, here's what I identified in patients since I've been working with your product. Let's try it here. While they were doing that, they were speaking on podiums around the world. They were publishing articles. We got over 400 papers published on it, and the product never got approved. So that goes to tech. So they had sort of built like a marketing team as it was. But they were going, and as soon as they would talk, and if you have 50 people, and then say out of there to three or four people in the lab giving presentations every year, you can imagine the interest it generates in other people. Yes. So then people would call back in, and it got to be almost self-fulfilling where we had to slow it down. And then you had to get into processes of how do you prioritize all of these. But we did it on a very limited budget. Um, the whole idea, again, was to say some may be a $10,000 grant, some may be a 200000 but it was enough to go. You know, and I took that idea even now in the most recent company that I was at. And, and we started when I got there. There was no collaborations. When I left, there was 30. That's really um, correct. You know, it, what, it, what strikes me is these days we talk a lot about agile development. And you know, that's like another story. And how do you do agile development <laughs> in, in also in the pharmaceutical side, right. not just in the medical device side and software. But in a sense, what you're describing is very much in alignment with an agile principle, mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really building those kind of learning loops yep. because that's, that's what way. you're yeah. talking that's, about, yes, right? Exactly. So as you're taking it in, you're learning more, you're bringing it, bringing it back into a central group. Yep. That central group takes it to the next level. Now you're back to experimenting. Yep. Yep. And then at some point you have to choose. Yep. So that's where you get down to the processes of, you know, what dollars do you have and then how do you, what do you want your portfolio to look like? And now I think we get somewhat into the mechanics. Now, small companies, so there's a difference again. A small company chooses one of those. 
yeah. all right, and said, I'm going here. So um, you mentioned at the beginning of different companies. So I was at Sandgard, and it was a small company who was working on a blood substitute, just like Integra was. But it was just that product. They were working on one product, and it was 100 people dedicated in one facility. Get up every morning. That's all you thought about was that product, all right? You worked on that product, and you went through. So priorities weren't that high. The priorities were how many dollars do we have left in the bank? What's the quickest way to get there? And are our investors going to continue to yeah. put money into it? Now, when you go into a big company, you have that one product. But I have been in very, f I've been in several big companies. Very few times do you have one person who gets to work on one project full time, 100% of the time mm -hmm. for several years. Okay, he wakes up in the morning, and usually it's your best people. All right, they wake up in the morning, they come in, and they go, ah. Oh, we just had a quality issue out in China. We really need to figure out what's going on. And the resources just oh. were, got moved. They yes, got absolutely. Moved. And they absolutely. get stolen over there because that's the highest priority to go yeah, through. Sure. So if you take an FTE, and we always said 2,080 hours for an FTE, 70% of it is all they have to work on, right? So now you're already down to 70%, but now if they're spending all this time on product support and doing it, they got 10%. So are you really being able to get it? So this dedicated Tiger Team concept is great for a small company, but it's a big difference in a large one. And I think that's often what fails in larger companies is that you don't have this ability to focus on one product or one idea to bring it there. So then how do you get back to customer thing again? So if you're working on it, do they have time to go out and interview with the customer when that's just another one of their jobs on their timesheet thing or whatever, it's another 2% of their time. So they don't have that same mindset of waking up. Yeah, and, and I think what's also important about what you just said is it's not even just having the time to go and, and, and watch and hear and work with the customers, but it's being able to then come back and Iterate. make sense out of it, right? And, and I think in innovation, one of the things that worries me quite a bit today is that the company agendas tend to be so busy. Mm -hmm. We think we're innovating because we are getting products out the door, but the question is, how innovative are those products? And I think there's a time for, for that innovation, which is my next gen, my incremental innovation mm. and all of that. But that isn't gonna be, that's not the game changer for the future, yeah. nor is it the one that's going to keep the portfolio in that sustainable level of growth, is yeah. it? No. Nope. No, and I mean, and then you start talking about innovation. Is it breakthrough innovation or is it, you know, substantial innovation or is it incremental? What's the difference between, uh, we know incremental. What's right. the difference between substantial and breakthrough? Substantial is, I would say, uh, uh, go to breakthrough. So breakthrough is this, aha, somebody came, um, I'll take, for example, um, the mRNA technology, you know, yeah. Now it's sort of old hat, but it's been around a long time. I call that sort of a breakthrough yeah. innovation. All and right? becomes the new gold standard. The new and, gold standard yeah. that's there. But now in between, um, there's this, you can take something that seems like a little bit of incremental, but it becomes a couple hundred million dollar product. Um, I'll use an example of at Integra, and just because that was where I was recently at. So have a collagen product that's been around for 20 years, 25 years, great product, everybody uses it. But then working with outside companies, being able to put into there a drug like BMP2, so Medtronic and others were able to apply it to that, and that's a billion dollar product. So I call that more than just incremental. That's building on an existing platform and utilizing it, maybe a whole new clinical space, yes. maybe using it with new applications, a new eye on it, saying, hey, we can use it here. So that's not really breakthrough. It's not just incremental of another version of that same product, but it's where those two meld kind of together and you have, could be a, potentially a blockbuster that could be a game changer. So if uh, looking at it from a portfolio perspective and being the insider inside the company, you said part of your job was to make sure that you had a healthy portfolio pipeline of products for the future. Was there, is there an ideal percentage of how much breakthrough, incremental, and, and signi uh, what did you call it? Well, there's substantial. In, substantial. substantial. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't think so, and I think that's where it gets down to the company, what your budget is, what's going on at the time, what the current yeah. environment is. Th most people, it seems like somewhere around, so if you think of percent of sales for an R&D budget, it's about 7%. 
-hmm. for most. I mean, average med tech, I think the last number I saw was between 7 and 8% of the top 100 med tech companies, you know, somewhere in that range of sales yeah. that they spend on it. So now out of that 7 or 8% of sales that are on there, how much of that back to your, do you allocate between it? And I think that, again, depends on the company's appetite. Yes, and, and their overall strategy, the I suppose, strategy. too, right? What space they're in. Yeah. And, we used to, and what I used to believe in is, is, you know, there's multiple ways to look at it. You're better at this than I am even, but you have your quadrants, you know, the low priority, low return, high priority, or, you know, high value, high return. Yeah. And you want to balance those. You don't want to do the ones that are low, low return with a high expense. I mean, right. those are the ones that you cross off. Well, and also, let's add to that conversation risk, right? So because oh, yeah. that high, high, high potential, high return often is right. really that novelty yeah. part where we also have a higher risk. Yeah. So we can't necessarily count on that. Now, that may be also the space that we have to ring face somehow, right? That's the one I believe you have to because those are the ones that don't, they don't come about in a month or two years or three years. Those are the five to 10 years. So you have to have a commitment to it. And yeah. you can't have a commitment just for this year. It's a longer term commitment. A longer term commitment. And that's not only dollars. Yeah. Um, it's people. Yes. Um, and again, I come back to this thing. So what we tried to do, and, and that's why I think it, it comes again between a startup and a big company. A startup or a smaller company, by definition, almost has that 100% commitment. That's their existence. People. That's why they are. That's their purpose, right? That's their purpose. They are there to do that. Yeah. The, the large company, I mean, I think when we met, I, I, you were in the, one of the largest companies that, that existed at the time. There were 10 different businesses. Yeah. Within one of the businesses, there were five separate business units. Yeah, right. uh, and God knows how many others. Uh, that's type of a company is a very different story. Is it possible to do that kind of ring facing somehow? I mean, we often talk about that in the company agendas that you, we need to have this entrepreneurial mindset and, and we need to right. uh, create um, innovation councils and innovation processes somehow separate from some of these other things. And I see them not always working very well. Right. Is it possible? It, can a large company truly innovate inside, or does it really have to go out? I think, I think it's possible. I think, I think, but it takes to that commitment. And so that takes leadership buying and a champion into saying, this means something to me, and I'm going to put the time in it, and I'm just going to forget about it for five years or seven years, and I'm going to continue to fund that for those five or seven years and see where it comes out. Yeah, I believe it is possible. I know it's possible because I've been there and I've done it in a couple of companies where we did it the last, you know, one of the companies that I was in, um, we carved it out and we got dedicated dollars towards that front end process and said it's going to be this dollars. Nobody can touch it. So if you got a problem business, um, you find out how to cut your marketing, cut whatever. We're not going to touch these because this is the future of the company. And we went from delivering three products in 2015 to delivering 10 products in 2019. Mm. Um, and you know the dollars, the return, about $10 million went up to 100 and some million dollars on new product innovations coming out of that because it was fenced off and it was able to do it. Now, I won't say 100% of the time, but it was pretty well fenced off. So I think it's possible. Question is, how big can you do and how many companies really do it well? Um, right. I, I don't see very many companies that do it very well because they get sucked away. So that comes back to our original part of our discussion of maybe you do this all outside. So this is where you get right. to these innovation ecosystems. So you can have somebody inside. And like I said, I was one person managing 53 universities, probably kind of crazy, but at the time it worked, all right? But even there, if you're working with four or five people, these startups now are the ones that have the 100% focus. So all of a sudden, um, I'll use a good example. So there's a group called Amber, mm -hmm. um, and they're in Ireland. So it's Trinity College, Royal College of Surgeons. They're funded by the Irish Development Authority. They have all this money. It's a group of about 70 to 100 people that are just there with really innovative ideas. We started a project working with them, and it's been going on for, well, and I now I was retired, but mm -hmm. it was for 15 years. But there's some incredible stuff that's coming out. But it took time to build that relationship to do it. So here's where I think that innovation can come. And where you wall it off is you wall it off outside. The other way maybe you can do it, and this is something I think is still an interesting model, is a company itself. So the company sits down and says, you know what, it's really hard out of my P&L 
yeah. to be able to support this innovation stuff when I need to firefight all these other things. So I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to borrow some money, mm -hmm. um, two percent, three percent. You can get really good rates now. Put fifty million dollars off, and I'm going to set it up into an isolated, almost like venture fund or development fund. I'm going to take this group, put them someplace else in the country. We're going to go out and either acquire four or five ideas, four or five million dollars a piece, or we're going to feed our own ideas in and we're going to have work together on it. But with that company out of there, if only one of those things hit in five years and it's a hundred million dollar opportunity, that's when you pass it over the fence and then you have more development, if you will, and execution at the company level and you let these guys over here. So I think you can set up outside venture funds or outside research groups to be able to do this that are working then with even more outside people to be able to carve it out. And that's a different skill set also, it's a right? Skill set. Yeah. And mindset. Mindset. Oh, yeah. So talk about mindset. That's the totally different kind of mindset, isn't it? Yeah. Now, the idea of partnering is so, so let's talk a little bit about that ecosystem right. and dissect that into, we'll unpack it, so to speak. <laughs> we, we'll think about academia first, right? right. You, you've had a lot of experience working with academic institutions. Of, so where does academia come in in healthcare innovation? What's, what's the role that they really play? Um, I think they're the ones that are that basic concept, the basic science. I mean, they're worrying about the basic science. I mean, my, my advisor, when I was doing my PhD, had spent 40 years working on thrombin. Mm. That's, I mean, who, who can do that in a company to work on one product, one concept, or whatever? So I think that's where academia comes down, is they have some far out thinkers. They have some very good, dedicated technologies. Um, no criticism, again, because I think, it, I, I hate to stereotype all of the universities. But it's really hard for them to think about the translational piece of where is this going to go. I think they're getting better at it mm -hmm. in today's world, like parts of grants now, or how are you going to translate this to the next level. Right. But, but I think the basic science is where that academia comes in. And then also skill sets and technical sets. Um, can one company have somebody who's good at x-ray tech, you know, x-ray crystallography, who's the top neuroscience, who's the top one in chemistry, who's, you can't have all these people on staff, and especially when you may only use them 5% or 10% at the time. But to go out and use that expertise that they've gained over 30, 40 years and they have a whole laboratory dedicated towards it, you can go in there, jump in, get a problem solved, get some credibility because they solved it, and get the answer back versus saying, well, I'm going to buy this piece of equipment. My company has to do it. I have to keep it inside. I got to build fences around it. It takes 10 times longer and you're never going to get as good a people. So I have to ask a cultural question about the collaboration with academia. I was actually speaking in a conference where we had uh, both academia and industry together, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the the challenges. And one of the challenges that came up was we measured very differently if we in the industry versus in the academia. And you just described one of the big uh, advantages of academia is that they are able to really concentrate on the science yeah. deep. But that also takes time. You can't yeah. hurry up the science along necessarily and in a speed of a milestone as we do very much in the, in the corporate side. Yeah. So that there's a clash. So when you're working with academia, what's that relationship like? Is it, is it more of an idea relationship? Is it tied to specific deliverables you're getting from there? What, what's, what's the... What's the model by which you engage academia? And again, there isn't that one answer. I think it varies based on the investigator and what you're trying to get out of that thing. Right. The most productive ones were win-win. Mm. Um, I think that's another key factor in all this. Um, you can't just go to somebody and say, do it for me, because I'm going to give you some bucks. Right. Uh, anything for a buck, all right, you can get it done. And maybe there's some stuff you need to do, maybe you'll get it done, a release assay or something like yeah. that. But where it's win-win. So they're going to, so what are their deliverables? They have to have publications. They have to be able to keep their staff engaged. They have to work on new ideas. So if they're getting that by being able to talk to you and say, I've got a cool idea, and you give, but what they need is the funding, no different than a grant to do it, and they need the initial products. A lot of times it's the company providing the product. Access to the product is a big deal. So now in kind, you give them material in kind, it allows them to work very well on a project. So what you're getting is you're getting top-notch research, you're getting good results, getting it out, you're meeting your deliverables or bringing something in. They're getting publications, they're keeping their staff excited, they're getting on podiums and they're presenting. So it's that win-win. Those are the ones that are most successful and I think that's really the model. And I think different universities, it depends as well. 
Um, they, I, I found over even the last 20 years, they've changed. Some, um, you go to Avamed meetings, they now, um, I found it fascinating, they have the partnering meetings. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Avamed, it's speed dating. Um, you speed send dating. speed dating for, <laughs> for companies. So you go in and you put your name in and you say, here's what we're working on. And then, so all of these academia, so I mean, we did this with, I mean, ended up with like, I had, I think I had 40 or 45 appointments and they're all 15 minute blocks of time, 10 to 15, sometimes 30 blocks of time. And you sit down and I'll use an example, Johns Hopkins, we went there and there's a gentleman by the name of Seth who's in charge of the exchange. So he's technology transfer. So he sat down and he said, what are you guys working on? So we went through the list of things that are really important to us and what we'd like to know. He went back and sent back to me then a list of all the investigators at the university that are working in that area. Then he talked to the investigators and said, which ones of you guys would be interested? And out of that, after a period of about a year, we kind of narrowed it down, narrowed it down. We found three or four people that we could continue to work with, one or two in particular that got to be good long-term relationships. So academia, tech transfer offices are looking for it now. Not all institutions are doing that. Right. But I've always found if I go to a university, um, we went up to Cornell. Um, spent the day up there meeting with their head of the engineering department. They bought us lunch and they brought in front of us every investigator, same thing. It was about an hour each for each investigator, what they were working on. And at the end of the day, we said, we got to meet each other. Worst case, we have new friends, new colleagues. Best case, we came up with a couple collaborations that were out of there because we didn't even know they were working on it. And they didn't know that we had a need for what they were working on. So I, 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 I you know, there's coming back to movies. We were talking about a movie buff. Mm -hmm. Um, movie City Slickers. And so you've got Billy Crystal and Jack <laughs> Palance, all right? And so here's, you know, Mitch. Billy, he says, you know, what is there, you know, what is there about, and, you know, Jack Palance holds up his fingers and he goes, what? And he goes, well, there's that one thing, you know, you have, what is that one thing? He said, well, what does life mean? And he said, well, that's for you to find out. And I think the thing about finding out what that is, you have to find out what that one thing is with everybody. And that comes through talking with them, working with them. And what, what, what time does it take? Like when people would call up and send in ideas to me, everybody said, well, should we take this call? You know, it's not right, it's not right in the portfolio. It's not the right. sweet spot. It's a half an hour of time. It's an hour of time. And Worst that case, half an hour could actually change the world. Could change the world. And it might not happen now. Right. It might happen in four years. It or might 20 happen, years. Or 20 years. And you wouldn't believe how many of these things go like this and come back to each other as you go in between. So I always found it was that communication piece. So if there was one thing, it's the communication piece of being willing to listen, and that's listen to patients, listen to the doctors. When somebody calls you up with an idea, don't, don't say again, you know, your limitations. Oh, it can't happen. It won't work. Right. Um, so that, but that communication piece, it, it always comes in. So that's, and I'm not sure companies do that. And I, uh, here I'll pick on even our education or on our training. Um, I'm not sure, how do you train somebody to do that. So we, you know, I'd get a lot of young scientists in. We're incredibly bright, bright people. Run every kind of ELISA, you know, Northern Blot, Southern, you name whatever direction was Blot you want to have, they could run that Blot. But then in terms of trying to go out to really be that inquisitive mind or that culture piece and that passion mm -hmm. to meet with people, I'm not sure how you train people to do that. I think that's almost like an inherent characteristic. And you need some of the doers on your team. But I think you also need some of those other people. You need the, the far out thinkers, you need the doers, but you also know, need those people who can translate. And you need an open mind, right? Because sometimes I think the, the more of an expert we consider ourselves, yeah. the less chance of asking questions and listening intently what somebody else has to offer. Yeah. And because that someone else may totally turn the corner in how we think about the same problem differently, right? right? Spot on. And this gives, this this is today, right? This is the this is the state of innovation today if you look at life sciences. The life sciences players going back to the ecosystem. Right. So we, we covered academia. Right. Now we've got our typical life sciences companies, but even the life sciences companies now, if you think about, we used to sort of just think about, oh, we got pharma companies and medical device companies. Now we got a whole gamut in between. Yeah. Diagnostics is, is, is a huge area, right? And then within those, 
the partnerships are now coming in. So we've got Google working medical yep. products. We've got Amazon coming into the picture. We have a whole lot of um, AI types of activity. You said robotics. Robotics. Yeah, we, we have semiconductor coming in. I, I came from high tech myself right. uh, many, many years ago. Right. It's, it's a really different world. It, it is. No. So can anybody's mind, it's okay, so you are the chief scientific officer by nature. How do you open your own mind? How do you allow yourself to stay in that ambiguity and curiosity? How do you do that? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question because you're trying to balance that with your job, I think. Right. Um, you, you have to, and here's where leadership comes in as well. So everybody has a boss. And I think if they give you that opportunity to do that, and if you can't do it, um, give some people on your staff that opportunity um, to be able to have that freedom to go out there to think about it. Don't pin them down, allow them to be able to do that. When you're told, and you know, everybody, I mean, this is just human nature. You get your paycheck, you have objectives, and, you have, and if the sales aren't there, you're not. So everybody's going to always worry what their boss wants and what the job is. If that job says you're free to think about these things and to do it, and I'm not going to raise you at the end as objectives based on that, I think you do create sort of a mindset or a culture. And you don't need to have everybody, but you need to have a couple of those people in the group. And as the chief scientific officer, you can't go in closed-minded. I mean, if you go in this not invented here syndrome, I think that's where you run into problems. I think you have to be thinking short-term, long-term, and you got to stand by it, but you need the support of those people on your leadership team, support of the board. The board has to say, this is the direction I want to go. If your board of directors says, no, nah, I just want singles and doubles. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah. So then maybe that's not the appropriate place. Maybe you do have to look somewhere else or whatever. But then you have to think about the long-term health of that company. Um, right. You know, it's because these things, you know, I, I love, <laughs> one of the things that I, I hated the most was somebody would say, I need a new idea and we, we have to have sales like in three months. <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, well, let me, let me get right on that. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, that's the thing. It's time. It's all yeah. about time and return. And, you know, some of these things, even the product development now in a fast process, let's say, for a device is, what, three years? That's, that's lucky. That's lucky. That's super lucky. We're looking at, I mean, we're still looking at four to six, I think, is the yeah. most quoted one. And that's and without clinicals, even. That's without clinicals. And depends, of course, on the complexity of that. Right. But I, I would say this. There's, there's, an, there's a little footnote on this conversation, which is the fact that we know, we know, that time to market is one thing, time to value it, to me is the better metric. Yeah. The, the industry is slow. Mm -hmm. It's slower than it needs to be. Right. That's a whole other issue. Right. But still, you're talking about several years. And in the pharmaceutical side, you, you're looking at it, exactly 12 yeah. to 15. Yeah. yeah no, and I think, so here again, um, one of the ways to approach it, I think, is through your portfolio. Um, mm. yeah, I think around, so part of this is deliverables in terms of execution. Yeah. So you know, now we're kind of moving into a different area here, but, yes. but when you talk about companies and you talk about execution, you know, that's a whole separate thing in terms of people say, oh, do I have to track time? Do I have to do, those are all important. If you don't want to know what people are working on and how you're spending your money internal and externally, how do you even get at evaluating how, what your return is on what that is? Then you have to think about your portfolio. And when you start thinking about your portfolio, um, we used to have this world planning process um, worked on for many years in several different companies. But it starts off with, it's essentially a linear process, and yet at the same time, people are doing it together. You start off with an unmet need, so a regional unmet need. That unmet need then goes on, and you have technology over maps that overlay on the top of it. So let's say I want to come up with a new one. I'll use an example with batteries. So there's a company, and so if you go out and if you ask a customer, I need a new battery. Mm -hmm. So what, what they'll do is they'll say, what's the problem? Well, my, my, my equipment shuts down. You've got to give me a better battery. And this was many years ago, and we asked them, we said, what do you mean? So their unmet need was they said, give me a lithium-ion battery. Mm. That, was, that was their request. Give me a lithium-ion. Right? They told you what to design. What to design. That was what they needed, lithium-ion. Okay, well, that's okay, but that's fairly short-sighted. At the same time, the technology map said you have hydrogen cells, you have all new technologies that are yep. coming on top of it. So 
But in order to do that, I need an expert who understands batteries. Oh, it takes me a year or two to hire them, two or three years to develop it. So they had to be four, five, six years ahead of what that was to be able to do it. But they reinterpreted that need on a bigger scope and said, here's my product plan and my portfolio. Short term is, yeah, lithium. So that's one generation. But we always insisted on three generations. So what was the real need, really? What was the real need? That's just the real need was I need something where a battery lasts a long time. There you go. Bingo. See, I love this because we, my company, of course, does a lot of work in, in the, that whole product development process. Right. And I keep always, is we, we have so much conversation in that front end. And how do you define right. the need? How do you define the need in such a way that didn't you allow the, the great people, the engineers and right. others to really solve that in the, in the, short and longer term yeah. with the most innovative ideas. Yeah. So I love the story. It's a great story. Yeah, no, and, and it's so true though, but then you got to focus on being able to do it. And like I said, that's time. That is time. That's five years, that's 10 years. But that's why we had three generations. So we would look at this product planning and if that was a device, it had to be three generations, so 15 years out. If it was a drug, it could be 30, 40 years. And people go, how do you think 30, 40 years? But hey, you have to, you have to be thinking there, where is it going to go? Where is the technology going to go? Where is it going to play? And there isn't this magic solution. And so, yeah, so I think you need that portfolio planning. And, and where is the world going to be by the time that it goes out? So, On that so you know, I mean, even just 12 years from now, right? If my product is going to come out 12 years from now, I'm not designing it for the world as it today. is today. I'm designing it or developing it for the world then right. and beyond. This is a really important point, right? Because that is no longer just about the unmet need. It's, it's no longer about just understanding it from the patient perspective, but it's, it's having to envision how care, for instance, is given in that environment. So, I mean, do you remember you know, yeah. those times when a lot of the care was in the, was very hospital centered, and then we started to talk about more home based care. That was a huge thing. Yeah. I mean, that sparked a still whole. Is. It still is. You absolutely right. And it's, I think it's going to continue to oh, be yeah. because now you're looking at the solution isn't anymore about just the the therapy. It's about all these other things. How do you deliver that therapy yeah. in a very different setting when you don't have an educated staff in the same way? You don't have the doctor there. You don't have the nurse there. Maybe the patient has to do self-injection, whatever it is. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and I think when you're doing it, and I'll throw this one maybe back to you because you've dealt a lot with this. So now another pitfall that I've seen you fall into is, is that, not you, but I mean, you're developing a product and now you're saying, I'm going to have to have this in 12 years. Yeah. So you're being the soothsayer and you're going, ah, I know it's going to be in 12 years. So you set up milestones and you set up a product profile and you're going along the way. So, all right, but you don't want scope creep. So everybody says, this has told me what you're going to make. I want you to deliver this. And you told me you'd get it here in eight yeah. years or 10 years. But all of a sudden, that whole environment, you predict it. Who knows what's going to happen in 10 years, where that evolution is going right. to go. So now if you change that product every year, to try to update it, that product design in those files. You're never going to get it out. You're never going to get it out the door. So you're in this do loop of constantly, constantly, and you're spending money, spending money, always letting everybody down because you're never delivering, you're never delivering. But yet if I go the other way and I say, well, come hell or high water, I'm going to develop this product and it's going to go out. Whether it works or it doesn't work today, I said I was going to get it done on time. You're going to have a product that's not going to be used by anybody and nobody's going to want it at the end. So I think that's another one of these conundrums that you have to face and you go through. And my answer to it has been, don't, here's where you think about the big problem, but you solve the short one. So if we talk about roadmaps, um, yeah. I use the analogy. So I live in California. I want to get to New York. Okay, some people will say, I'm going to take the direct flight. I'm going to go from California to New York and get there in four hours. It's great if it works, but to be able to do that constantly, I think what you need is you need the short-term ones as well. So I might go to Denver. I might go from Denver to Chicago, Chicago, and each one of those milestones. Now I've got a bite-sized chunk of a deliverable that I can look at and I can right. think, I can get my arms around, company can buy off on, you can invest in. And if you do that, and if you make three, four, five separate little innovations, but you have this roadmap of what the ultimate goal is in mind. Beautiful, yeah. 
all of a sudden at the end you've solved the problem because you can't try to do five innovations at once when you don't know where it's going. And you have yourselves a pipeline. So, so some things that come along with that one is, of course, you have to really have more of a platform thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to, you know, we use target product profile right. a lot, right? A lot. So I look at target product profiles as the place where we think about the value drivers, both longer term and short term. So in a sense, what you do is if you're doing the platform strategy, you're looking at multiple different target product profiles. So first one may be this, second one, third one, but you've already right. mapped them out. Okay. And because you're releasing that first one, now comes back to your original conversation right. uh, in, in, from your past. Right. You're also doing iteration of learning with that first yeah. one. So hopefully your second one is, is absolutely, absolutely, and getting further and further into yeah. some of the new needs. So, so this is a, an important concept because it's a strategic way yeah. of looking at your pipeline, but it also right. requires that then on the execution side, yeah. you are building into that execution agenda, the development of certain types of platforms, mm -hmm. technology-wise, scientifically. Yeah. So I think that that first release is, is hard because you're developing, you're developing the platform, right. Right. but you're also having to get a product out. Yeah. It's like changing the tires on a car, they say, when it's going. Right, and yeah. you don't want to develop the platform for th that one product. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to have the cadence that you just talked about, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, and, but, but the other part of that is then what is what is that goal that the company or somebody is funding to go towards and i get it it's the short term one but you can't do start stop the one thing that you and i both know that'll kill it so if you have this product one and somebody gets the first one out and now they go well cool i'm making money let's stop here i don't need those other four or five and turn that faucet off for a couple of years and go well, you know what now i need a product again can you go back and revisit that portfolio it's already too late somebody else is out there Exactly, exactly. So you need that commitment, that long-term commitment with a short-term focus, I think, in order for that to be successful. So let's, let's summarize what we've talked about so far. Right. I'm, I'm still going back to my agenda, right? So right. I have to make sure. So what I heard is we got a front-end agenda, yeah. and that front-end agenda needs to really start and end with those unmet needs, mm -hmm. and then building the right ecosystem of players to come together to make sense right. of them, and through that discernment process, we will have to also eventually discern the, the few areas that we're really going to go after. Exactly. Right. And focus and on those long term. Focus on those long term, right? But then now we're getting into the pipeline process, portfolio management process. This is where we get much more uh, concerned with the short term. Yeah. So we're looking at short term, longer term. We deploy platform strategies as well as uh, technology roadmaps, as well as um, uh, well, what am I losing? The, the technology roadmaps, platform strategies. What else is really important in that one? Clinical and commercial. I mean, is getting to be more clinical and commercial involvement. involvement. Absolutely, because yeah. now that's also uh, it gets back to regulatory and it gets back to being yeah. able to show it's going to work. I mean, you know, so <laughs> clinical development plans. I mean, that's the other thing. People do it, and if you do this sequentially, and they say, make a product. I do some analytical stuff and build it and they will come philosophy. And then I'm gonna move it into preclinical. But meanwhile, you don't have that clinical development. So if you write the back first, if you write your product label and say, here's what I'm gonna claim, then you say, all right, to claim that, what's gonna be my regulatory strategy to get that approved? That's the beauty of the target product profile, isn't exactly. it? Inter exactly. Into As an internal strategic tool, not just, the, not just figuring out the claims for the, Right. Uh, yeah. And then your clinical development plan falls in and you say, well, to get to that clinical plan, I need this. Pre but when you're doing all of that and you're doing it up front, now you spread it out and you're taking some of the risk because the other yeah. part of this is the risk out of that portfolio Absolutely. by doing that. Now, I would assume also that this is where we need to set discernment around where we where do we actually end up launching. That should have maybe happened already to some degree in the front end, right because end. those global launches will look very different depending on which part of the globe we are, which, you know, I'm gonna actually bring you back to, yeah. to, to dissect that one in another time. Yeah. Um, so we're going now from, from the front end through the pipeline into the execution. Right. One more topic, and that's the execution. Yeah, it's so I, critical. All that stuff we just talked about is 
falls apart if you at the end you don't deliver. And well, what's the measure where, of innovation? It, something's got to come out the door and that something has to add yeah. some value out there yep. in the world, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I know you and I met originally around program and project management. Do you yeah. remember that? Oh my no, gosh. Like what, 20 years ago? Um, we, had some, <laughs> no, we won't say how. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, it was. must have been like five years five, ago, yeah, perhaps a yeah. couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we did some really great work. Um, you know what's funny? If it was 20 years ago, we're still struggling with the same we things are. in this industry. Isn't that something? No. We just simply don't know how to execute very well. And meanwhile, the world has gotten more complex. Now we're executing with partners. We're not executing in... You know, and ex virtually. And virtually. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a crazy, crazy um, you know, chaos sometimes yeah. just to try to execute. Do you have one or two things that you say, these are, these are the heart of do this well and execution will be better? Yeah, I think if I were to pick one, I think it's handoffs. Handoffs. Handoffs, and I've seen this in small companies, and I've seen it in big. It's better in small companies because you're all in one room, one building. Yeah. So here's where everybody's co-located and all the rest. So handoffs are a little bit better, but use the analogy of a road race um, or a running race. So if you're going to run a mile, yeah, um, and you have a baton and you got four runners, if the second guy drops that baton and you pick it up and you go, chances are the third runner might be able to actually pick it up and run and still get the race and might actually still win. Yeah. If you're running a 400 meter race, everything is in the handoffs, all right? I mean, you have to have fast guys, but that guy drops it, or if you follow the handoff, you know, as you're going through yeah. it, you don't win the race. So the world we're living in now, everybody wants things done quicker and faster, but we're still in this one. So preclinically, we're just talking about all these different steps and process. So you can have a great product development process, but if you do the first part of it, and then all of a sudden along the way, process development or manufacturing, they come in at the end and you say, now, I want you to scale this up. And they it, go, well, if they come at the end, that's too late, too right? Late. They, they needed to be there in the, at, at the, the table. Very beginning. And that's back to basics of core team. So all of this is back to these basics again of you have an integrated core team for everybody's input and you're all involved at the beginning and you do those handoffs as they go through at the right time. But if you do this sequentially or you don't have the right handoffs or you drop the baton, um, it's going to fall apart. If you get, even if you scale it up, now manufacturing says, well, I don't have any room on the floor and I wasn't planning, I don't have a plan for it. See, you're not going to have a product out. You know what is important about what the terms that you just used? We talk about core teams. You said you have an integrated core team. Right. And we talk about integrated project plans, but yes. behind an integrated project plan is an integrated core, core team. team. That means we're talking all the time. We're yep. interacting all the time. And we're making decisions together. Yeah, we, we're absolutely doing this together. Right. This isn't, oh, we'll show up in a meeting every once in a while to yep. report on some Gantt chart, right? That, right. That's not nope. integrated nope. project and program planning. Nope. So, or you show up. My big beef on it was somebody'd show up for they have you. They, you'd get assigned a core team member. Yeah. And you'd show up and you'd make a decision. You would talk about it as a core team, and they would go back and talk to their boss. Yeah. And their boss would say, "Nah, that was a really dumb idea. I want to do something different." So two weeks later, when your core team meets again, they come back. Oh, I just changed it. We want to do something completely different. So now you change it to what that one said, but now somebody else. So this up, over, down, up, over, back, down, because yeah. those people don't have the decision-making capabilities that are on that They're team. not empowered to make those decisions. Not empowered yeah. to do it. And so we talk about one-way doors and two-way doors. I mean, some of these things go back and forth and back and forth, yeah. and you're sitting there with this, and you're trying to make a call. You talk about adding time onto a project or the biggest thing that's going to kill it. Now you've just added how much time, and in the end, you might not have something that anybody agrees to. Right. So what's the... What is the role of the function, though? It, since you brought up, okay, they, the core right. team member goes and talks to their boss, comes back. But what, is the, what would be the ideal role of a function if you have truly integrated core teams working well? Function to me is around execution. So that function does their piece of the puzzle. Yeah. All right. They do what they're good at. Again, a man's got to know his limitations. All right. You don't want process development guys saying, hey, I can do what the clinical guy is doing. I don't want to be an amateur clinician or whatever. So everybody has to have that. They have to have their process in place. How, they have to streamline their processes now with IT. How are they going to do it? How are they going to execute on it? They have to have their own sub teams that are doing it. But you need to have a representative of that function who's got enough power and enough decision-making capabilities to make the call to represent on that core team. And sometimes, you know, you'll see somebody's on eight or ten different teams. And, oh. That's, that's 
not gonna no. it's not gonna fly or they're there and they can't make the call or they're not I mean so I think that's really it's really hard for a function to give up that authority so if I'm running a function um, the other thing that you fall into then is then the head then you say all right well then you come so the head of that function has to go to all of the core team meetings because he's the only one who can make the call yeah that's that's Does that what makes sense yeah that's a tough model as well but that's actually what happens quite often it does yeah it does. so it, it it almost then translates to needing to define that core team members role very differently yeah. and very different from all the others yes. and really think about so if my function is small small and relatively um, well defined for mm -hmm. only a certain things but now yeah. you look at you know you look at a uh, manufacturing and operations right. environment there's so many different elements to that environment right. how can one person ever totally represent that so I think that situationally defining what that needs to look like becomes a very important part of making that integrated core team work. I completely agree. Uh, so I'll use the, I'll look at leadership teams. Yeah. So if I go to a company and if I look at the C-suite, mm -hmm. so you have a CEO yep. and you have all of these functional leads. You have a manufacturing, a quality, a regulatory. Right. Seems to kind of work at that level where somebody can make a call, right? Mm -hmm. Um, now you get down to that next level of a core team or whatever. Who's the CEO? That's the project leader for it. Is he really the mini CEO for that project, or is he just kind of a figurehead? I mean, what what is his role in there? And I, or a coordinator for that matter? Because some of manager. some of those project managers are still coordinators. Exactly, right. exactly. And then those people that are there, how come their boss can make a call, but now they're just. They have to go back, again, communication, talk to their teams, talk to everything, come prepared for that meeting so when they come in, they can make a call that's on it. Now, there's going to be exceptions here and there, but they have to be able to do it. So if it works at a leadership team, why doesn't it work at a core team? And I think it's because, I don't know if people still really seriously take a core team as like a, a mini business. I mean, in a sense, you're running that project. You have a CEO, your core team leader, and you have your leadership team, and they're making calls, and they're running the project. They're working with all of their people behind the back, you know, and they're doing all the stuff that needs to be there and get it done. But, but I've, you don't see all the teams operating that way. I mean, you have people who don't show up, or then they send a delegate, yeah. and don't even have the meeting sometimes. I mean, it's just, it's not. Well, working. and it, it does take, actually, a different way of developing those core team members. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to give them the power to make decisions unless you feel confident. Yep. That is, so the, the, the leadership team yep. that you're talking about, the senior executive team, right? right. They've taken a, a lot of time and effort to really think about who's in that, in that senior leadership yeah. team. And in turn, they've built a network within their own organization so that trust. when they come to that, uh, there's trust. There's trust and they know that they're getting the right information from their entire organization mm -hmm. coming in. They're also providing it back to the organization. It's got to work the same way. It has, it has to. Yeah. And, and then I go, well, how come it doesn't always work that way in R&D or in, you know, in company? So we have a Super Bowl coming up. Um, we're, we're talking now two days before the Super Bowl. Um, does the quarterback, I mean, you talk about whoever it is, Tom Brady, any one of these quarterbacks that are really great quarterbacks. Does he go out and coach the linemen? Does he go out and worry about the receivers? You have an offensive coordinator, you have a line coach. You have, everybody has their skill position. Yeah. And so, and even I'll go back even farther. Let's take not the Super Bowl out. Um, I was in Chicago at the time the Bulls were around. They weren't winning and they brought in a coach, Phil Jackson. And all of a sudden, Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen, all of these people were working together and they were passing the ball and they were running an offense. And so this leadership role, I mean, people, you can't. That is crucial. It's crucial. I mean, people, you can't underestimate what one person can do to be able to do it. But then if a sports team can execute with 11 people and they all have different roles, different jobs, different skill sets, different backgrounds. And if they can do that and you see teams that win Super Bowls and teams that lose 12 games in a row. I think it's the same thing for R&D. So having those right people, that right leader, that right quarterback who have, may be the core team leader, yeah. and then the right people on the line, the rest, and they have to have the talent to be able to do it. You can be successful. And I've, you know, I've worked on some incredibly successful core teams. And when you see it, you know it is kind of and it feels and it feels great. It, feel, it feels great. It. Oh, um, the team is unbelievable. Jazz, There's this enthused. synergy. You know, it's almost like you just you don't even have to make an effort. It comes together. But you did make a big effort getting the team to that level because it was behind there, and you had the right team. Members. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Well, we're going to have to start closing for the day, but I would love to have you drive. I know you had to fight some traffic coming <laughs> over here, but I'm, I'm going to invite you back. Before you go, though, today, um, you are now kind of a free agent. You said, uh, you did say earlier right. said, yeah, did, that in innovation, you need to consciously set some folks free right. to just go do it. Well, you, right. you are free. What's going on in that head of yours right now? <laughs> What's, uh, wh what does freedom give you today and where are you headed next? Oh, that's, yeah, it's something obviously I've been thinking about. So I've retired now, it's going on five months. I'll admit the first two or three were a little strange. Oh, then, um, well, I know your pace when you were working. I was wondering if you were driving your wife crazy. Um, yeah, well, it took some adjustments <laughs> as well. I mean, it's the management team, right? It's the, the same. We've been married for 44 years, but it's still the management team. And you have to know who's CEO and who's not. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask uh, no, the next no, question. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> the obvious one. We won't even go there. No. So, but working through that. But so now what I've found that I, I'm kind of settling into is I get to work on things now that I want to work on versus things that I necessarily have to work on. All right. Yeah. That was a big one. And then the other one is after doing this for 35, 40 years or whatever, being able to talk to, I, I find myself, so I'm doing right now some advisory roles mm -hmm. for some companies. I mean, there's one company and they said it was okay. So I'm, I mean, like this gel for med, they have a peptide to be able to do self-assembling peptides. Uh -huh. Really cool technology, multiple applications or whatever, um, but they're fairly new. But yet it's really cool because they don't have very many people, but they're using this outside model of using outside people to do it. So saying, well, why let, why let new companies make the same mistake that I probably made five times in my career? And you know? it's like, and you can still do it. I'll just tell you. I can't tell you what to do, but I can advise you and I can say, here's what you might want to think about doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I've, you know, it's vuja day. Deja vu is, you know, you think you're... Vuja Vuja Day. Day. I've been there before. <laughs> I know I've been there before and I screwed this up. So, you know, I'm finding now I'm working with several different companies of, and the startup, mostly all startup because it's that early front end thing, but saying, how can you get, what we're, all the things we're talking about, yeah. how can you get to the end? How can you prevent all of these pitfalls? How can you do it faster? How can you do it with trying to get the answer? So being able to try to say, I don't have all the answers. I said right. earlier, I don't. But being able to provide a little bit of input and little, you know, history back to them and saying, you know, because uh, I do think there's something to be said for institutional memory. And having done it a couple of times, it's a lot easier when you're going back to do it. So providing that and then kind of looking for other, you know, still out there looking like for board roles where you can provide a higher view on the top of it and be able to oversee it. You know, and um, I'm not looking to get into, you know, the 40 hours of, you know, on the road grinding every day, you know, trying to do it. Um, I had a full-time job before. So, so I, shouldn't, I shouldn't hire you to become one of those mm -hmm. consultants who like, just goes out there every just week. Goes out there every week and fills yeah. it in, but no. But, but the kind of discussions we're just having, to have those with CEOs or other people or younger people. More strategic conversations strategic. also at the board level, but also yeah. the very tactical for that, that yeah. new company that's trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. yeah. Those are the things that are fun. I mean, it gets you yeah. up in the morning because you can't, yeah. you know, I mean, you can't just start science and you don't do this, you know, for the, the fame and the fortune. It's because what you love to do. Do you consider yourself a scientist? Um, yeah, how how would you describe yourself? Scientist or, or something else? That's a really, nobody's ever asked that. That's a really tough question. Um, I think, I think some, yes, as a scientist only, and I say scientist because from a pragmatic, practical approach of doing it. But I don't like to pigeonhole it into a scientist because one of the things that I found over my career is being able to interact with management, with patients, mm -hmm. um, people on the outside. I enjoy that as much, but am I marketing, am I sales, am I, you know, is it a leadership role? Um, what, what is that? You know, so uh, you, I, don't, I don't like to just say I'm a scientist because that's kind of like, well, you're that egghead that comes up with cool ideas and tells me something and then goes away. So, so I don't know, it's kind of that combination. My, 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 my life has sort of evolved or my career has evolved into to being something more than that. See, one of the things that I've always loved when I've been working with you is that you are able to see the big picture. You are very excited and passionate about what science can offer as well, but, but really very pragmatically putting it back down sure. to the patient. We started this conversation with the patient. We're going so to end it with end. the, it absolutely has to end over there. And it's, it's wonderful to sort of be able to balance that and also balance the, the, um, the very front end activity with the 
with getting that product out the door because yeah. that is when it makes the difference for the patient yeah. at the end. Yeah. So yeah. one piece of advice for someone who is just starting their career in life sciences. I think you have, you have to be flexible and you have to listen. I've come back to the communications. The communication piece is just so important. Listen and learn. Um, and the agenda will emerge from that. It will. It will along the way. And you'll, you'll find it'll take you in strange places, but you'll always learn something. You know, you, you know, I have people that come that, you know, did a job and I want to do this job. Well, no, I mean, try this. I mean, this whole thing about everything has to be vertical in terms of a career. Lateral moves are very cool. Um, you learn so many things as you're going along that you didn't want to at the time. And all of a sudden you go, wow, that was really valuable. And you find yourself coming back to the lesson learned that you were there. And yeah, so do that. And then the second one, I think, is, is sort of passion, like what you're doing. I always had three phrases. I told my kids this. I told everybody who worked for me, and they'll know it. If anybody ever sees this, they'll see the slides, because I always put them up there. You have to enjoy what you're doing. You have to keep learning. And you have to have fun. I love that. We'll end with that note because it's great advice. And for those who have been listening, we've been actually mentioning a lot of very pragmatic tools. What do you say if the two of us get together for uh, a little bit of um, package making afterwards and we'll give a few of these ideas in pragmatic ways yeah. for those who are listening and would like to apply them? I think that might be uh, another little bonus we can give. Love to. I, I, I think, yeah. Uh, no, be more than happy to because I think it's about getting, passing it along to other people to do it. So hopefully, I, I, I just enjoyed the conversation. Unfortunately, you and I could probably talk for another 10 or 12 hours about each one of these at least. Yes, and we might <laughs> just do that. Thanks so much, Ken. Uh, thank you, Tati. Thanks for having me come up. I really do appreciate it. It's a, good to see you and it's a great opportunity. It's great to see you. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Leaders Agenda podcast. You can continue the conversation with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter by following Action for Results.